Hi everybody and welcome to an exciting piano video here at Miriam Pianos. Today we are talking about upright pianos. Everything you need to know about upright pianos if you are in the market for one. We're not going to tell you what piano to buy or how much money to spend, but we are going to cover all of the critical areas of difference between these lovely instruments. The price ranges, the sizes, how to go about selecting one, the weak points to check out for as well as what makes one different from another. If it's the first time to the channel, we would sincerely appreciate it if you did subscribe. And without further ado, let's learn a little bit more about upright pianos right away. So we're here in 2020 and over the last 12 months, we have experienced almost a twofold increase in the number of medium uh, range and premium range upright pianos that are sold. And one has to ask the question, why? What are the trends that are driving those spikes in sales? Uh, and I guess another fundamental question that often gets asked, why would I buy an upright piano that costs as much as a baby grand? Because of course, most people have a traditional paradigm in their mind that says if you can afford the baby grand that's always the preferred option both from an aesthetic standpoint as well as a musical one well there are a number of realities which are pushing people towards those uprights and in a lot of cases and what we're going to be talking about in the video today is there's actually a lot of musical reasons why an upright for the same price as a baby grand may actually make more sense in your particular case so the first reason is obviously space uh, more and more customers out there are living in smaller situations uh, where they are uh, very often uh, in stacked housing. Um, this is a very common trend uh, with homes now that rather than being spread out uh, and only two stories high, uh, we've got these stacked homes which are much closer together, a uh, lot more stairwells, and of course grand pianos take up a huge amount of floor space, and uprights just find uh, better places up against some of those uh, walls where you've got stacked housing, townhouses, condos. Uh, so there is a logistical space reason why upright pianos make a lot of sense in that particular case. A second reason is that there, I would argue, probably been even more innovation on the upright side of things than the grand side of things over the last five years. And so there are some interest points that are driving people towards uprights. One of them is the fact that there are now hybrid and silent upright pianos available. There are on the grand side, but there's been a lot more advancement done uh, on the upright side from a wide range of customers. So there's better integration with digital uh, tools, um, iPads, software, things like that, uh, that allow you to use upright pianos in silent mode or in like a multimedia uh, kind of a production mode. So that's the second reason why upright pianos, I think, are really spiking in popularity. So let's talk about the basics. Upright pianos come in a number of sizes. You are gonna find an upright piano starting uh, about the smallest is 42 inches, then there are 44 inch, 45, 46, 47, 48. Uh, really, you're gonna be able to find sizes at almost every inch point uh, for anywhere from about 42 all the way up to 54 inches. Some very common sizes that you'll hear out there are the uh, 44, 46, 48 inch, which is the size of uh, the, the extremely well-known brands, the Yamaha U1, as well as the Kawai K300. Then there are 50 inch pianos, such as uh, the Yamaha U2, which isn't really uh, available uh, other than in used anymore, uh, as well as the Kawai K500. And then there are the full size 52 with the occasional 53 and 54. So that's your total size range. And when we're talking about those sizes, we're referring to the height of the piano. Uh, what's interesting to note is that that's always a measure from the very bottom of the floor to the very top of the piano. So there are some instances where doing apples to apples comparison within two or between two brands can lead to some misleading conclusions because just because uh, something uh, sitting on the floor might have different size wheels, the inside scaling may be different. And so you can't always draw absolute conclusions on things like string length 
or soundboard size simply based on the cabinet size. But anyway, those are the cabinet sizes that you are gonna find when you are out there shopping for upright pianos, as I said. What are the price ranges that you're gonna hit? Starting at the very bottom, we've got free. Uh, you can find numerous used uh, older upright pianos. They're typically shorter, uh, 42, you know, 44, 46 inch American built pianos, a lot of uh, post-World War II pianos that are being given away uh, for free right now. Uh, in a lot of cases, you're getting what you pay for. Uh, a free upright piano of that era is not going to be particularly musically successful. Uh, in many cases, uh, if you really strip away all of the, of the bias associated with you know, acoustic versus a digital piano, uh, a digital piano for, uh, say, $1,000 uh, by many measures is actually going to give you a better instrument to play on than a free acoustic upright. Um, I know there are a lot of opinions on uh, that uh, position, but that's my own personal opinion. Uh, go, moving up from there, you're going to start to hit used Korean and used Japanese pianos. Anywhere from about $1,000 to $4,000 is a very common range uh, that you find. And these would be for instruments such as Yamaha U1s, uh, Kawaii K3s, K2s, uh, you know, Yamaha had uh, a number of other series, uh, the LU201, uh, some P series out there. So you're going to find the whole gamut of Japanese and Indonesian made uh, Yamaha and Kawais, as well as Korean made uh, Yang Changs uh, and Samic product from, uh, at this point, probably uh, anywhere from about the early 1970s up to the early 2000s is is the kind of the used market. It's very popular. You will want to take some sort of a technician or at the very least a piano person who's in your life who knows a little bit about pianos. Uh, and we've done a separate video on exactly what you should be looking for when you go shopping for a used. So please be sure uh, to check that out if you're in that category. New upright pianos start at around the 4,000 USD uh, range. Those are going to be for 44 inch factory made upright pianos. Typically they're going to be made either in Indonesia or China at that price. And if you're buying it from a reputable company, I've mentioned, you know, Kauai and Yamaha as, as two companies uh, that make traditionally uh, dependable products, uh, you can expect a mechanically sound instrument with a fairly consistent uh, tone and something that isn't going to require too many tunings. Not a lot of tonal refinement available at this price range. Uh, but for people who are just starting out, parents who are looking for the first acoustic piano for their kids, uh, and really the whole point of an instrument at that price point is to give a proper dynamic response. You can really start developing a good technique and the ability to uh, get the instrument to speak properly at all sorts of different price ranges. Um, that then bumps up from, uh, from 4,000 when you scale that up to about 10,000 is where you start to get the 46, 48, and maybe about the 50 inch pianos from uh, those same companies. And so you're increasing the height of the instrument. Uh, and in some cases, you're also going to be increasing the quality of the materials or the advancement of the design. Still, these price ranges are intended in a lot of cases for either institutional use or student use. So as you creep up towards that $10,000 range, you may be getting um, a slight improvement in the quality of the materials, uh, a slight improvement uh, in the, uh, I guess, the factory uh, preparation, but really what you're paying for is just the increases in size. Once we cross the $10,000 threshold, we start to get into some of these hybrid um, pianos. And when I say hybrid, I don't mean the digital acoustic hybrid pianos. I actually mean pianos where there is some component of European manufacturing as well as Chinese manufacturing. And so there are a number of brands that sort of mix and match both uh, labor and parts um, in heading in both directions. Uh, and really these are upright pianos in those low teens. And this is where you're basically trading off maybe a Japanese um, assembly, which does have some value for uh, slightly more expensive components uh, that are being matched uh, with slightly less labor costs. And so that's where you get into low teens. Um, the sweet spot for people who are looking for a really great balance of high quality tone, high quality materials, 
and a manufacturing quality which is equal to that of say a Japanese plant is when you get into your high teens and that is going to be uh, European built pianos uh, in some cases from Germany uh, in some cases from Czech in some cases from Poland um, and these are the instruments uh, that really seem to be increasing in popularity uh, over the last short little while. These are instruments that start to have the potential to actually match the musical performance of a baby grand, in some cases outdo the musical performance um, of some of those lower cost baby grands and still preserve your, uh, you know, your footprint, a nice small package. After you hit the, about the $20,000 mark, then it becomes a real uh, connoisseur's marketplace. You're largely into uh, European and American built pianos at this point, and it becomes a highly subjective, highly personal uh, matter of taste. Uh, that 20,000 ranges all the way up to about 60 or 70,000 for the most expensive upright pianos in the world. The C. Beckstein Concert 8 would be a really great example of that, perhaps one of the most uh, well-known instruments uh, aside from maybe the K-132, um, which is the Hamburg Steinway uh, full-size instrument. Uh, Busendorfer has some really well-known uh, upright pianos as well up in that sort of price point stratosphere. So that covers our price ranges. So another difference between upright pianos besides the price points, besides the sizes, uh, and I've alluded to this when we were discussing price points, is the difference between a factory-made instrument versus what is you know, commonly referred to as a handmade uh, piano. It's a bit of a misnomer because there's actually hand workmanship that goes into most factory pianos and there are what people would probably call factory processes associated with handmade pianos. So really, where do these labels appropriately apply and what do they really mean? Uh, a much better way to, or I would like to almost have that uh, those labels replaced uh, is either in limited production or mass production, which is a lot more appropriate, as well as manufacturing time. Because when people think of a handmade product, I think one of the impressions uh, that it gives people is that it's taken longer to do and that there's been more oversight. And in that regard, that's absolutely true. Most of the upright pianos uh, that carry the label handmade, uh, where they are applied with some objectivity, I should say, are instruments that certainly have had uh, some uh, you know, machining uh, that's been used. There's definitely been uh, some automated processes, but there's been an enormous amount of time by one or several members of that assembly crew uh, that has gone into the regulating of the action, the assembly of the action, uh, the shaping of the soundboard, a lot of the really higher level uh, carpentry that makes the difference between a piano that resonates well versus one that kind of just sits there and thuds away. And the difference in the manufacturing time can be extraordinarily large. And I'll give you an example. For a four or $5,000 factory made upright piano, we could be looking at a manufacturing time of just a few dozen hours, let's say 30, 40, 50 hours. Uh, and that would include the entire manufacturing process. Uh, from anything that was being done by hand, uh, by machine. It's a very quick assembly and there isn't a whole lot of oversight or constant revision of the way that the piano has been set up. On the other hand, uh, an upright that I've just uh, referenced a few minutes ago, the Concert 8, uses over 300 hours of assembly time, which is an increase of a factor of six, five or six, uh, and what goes into that extra time? Well, I've already mentioned it. It's refinement of that soundboard, shaping that taper on the soundboard so that it's perfect, regulating the instrument numerous times so that you're getting exactly the same response on each key and you're getting the proper level of control in both the lower dynamic ranges as well as the upper ranges. Voicing all of the hammers so that you're getting exactly the right type of bloom. And then of course, manufacturing the frame of the instrument so that the entire body is actually resonating instead of just acting as basically a box for the soundboard and the strings. So those are the types of differences that you get between a factory instrument and a handmade instrument. Normally there is an increase in the quality of the materials. There's often an increase in the complexity of the design, 
But the biggest one is the amount of hours that are being spent on that instrument to refine it to make sure that there is a high level of consistency in every measurable part of that instrument when it leaves the factory. Another common question or uh, line of research that people get into uh, is understanding the difference between an American upright piano, an Asian upright piano, and a European upright piano. Um, we associate all sorts of uh, you know, baggage with those, with those labels, what it means to have an American piano or, or an Asian piano or a European piano. Uh, but what does it actually mean? Does it really boil down to technical differences in the instrument? And is there any sort of um, um, homogenous uh, consistency that you can actually really say, oh, that's a European sound or that's an American sound? Well, in some cases, I would say yes. Let's talk about an American sound first. There's only a three manufacturers in the United States right now even making upright pianos. That would be Charles Walter, uh, Mason and Hamlin, and Steinway. And what are the consistent factors that you find in those three pianos or piano manufacturers? Well, American uprights, much like American grands, tend to have a very mid-range tone. There's often a high level of use of hardwoods, uh, maples, which tend to accentuate some of those mid-range tones. Uh, they tend to have a very uh, large dynamic range. Um, and they are also known uh, really for the exterior furniture as well. Um, American pianos on the negative side aren't known for particularly great actions or control. Uh, they are also not known for a great deal of tonal consistency. Uh, from the lower range to the upper range. So reasons to go with an American piano would be if you're looking for a wonderfully made piece of furniture that is also a piano, that, that's an excellent solution. Uh, if you, uh, as your, your ear just kind of prefers uh, a more mid-range tone, that would be obviously uh, a second reason to go with that instrument. But if you're looking for a truly precise experience, well, the Asian and the American ones or sorry, the Asian and the European pianos may offer a little bit more in that category. When it comes to Asian pianos, it's very difficult to lump this into a single category because you have uh, very basic, low quality uh, pianos uh, from China, but then you have uh, fairly advanced instruments with a fairly high uh, construction quality now also starting to come from China. You have Japan with a very mature piano market that's uh, literally 100 years old. Um, you have some Korean pianos where that market has actually quite rapidly declined. There are not a lot of Korean uh, built pianos anymore or being uh, exported. It's, it's shrunk quite a bit. And those manufacturers have shifted to Indonesia. So you have these major centers of uh, manufacturing and really four of them. Uh, China, Indonesia, Japan, and Korea. Uh, is there any sort of tonal consistency to any one of those four? And I would say with the Japanese, yes. A Japanese Kawai has a predictable sound. A Japanese Yamaha has a pretty predictable sound. And for the most part, I think some of the Indonesian product does as well. But beyond that, it's a complete mash of tonal styles, uh, actions, parts, soundboards that are being used. And so when you dive in, particularly if you're diving into the Chinese piano market, this is where a high level of research, really understanding if you're buying a brand uh, that has some, uh, you know, some uh, heritage to it. And when I say heritage, I don't mean, uh, you know, 150 year old uh, trademark that's been slapped on it. I mean, it's actually got 20 or 30 years of a track record being produced in China by the same factory. Uh, and there's been some cycles of improvement uh, that have occurred on that piano. And I think there are three or four factories in China uh, that, ha you know, that, that are approaching that uh, type of refinement. Uh, and those are worth a look at. But it's definitely necessary for you to at least understand where the piano is coming from um, and uh, kind of base your research around that. So for the Japanese pianos, these are uh, characteristically very colorful instruments. With Kawai, you've got a little bit warmer of a bass in a mid-range uh, and a very, very strong treble as well. 
Yamaha tends to uh, have the tone fairly focused a little more to the mid-range of the instrument. The bass response on most Yamahas is not quite as warm or not quite as uh, strong as on a Kawai, but you've got some really lovely mid-range uh, tones uh, through the Yamaha that are a little on the brighter side, very, very clear uh, on those instruments, uh, but not quite as much clarity on the very, very top of those uprights. Um, so those are your uh, Asian pianos. On to the European side of things, and we've got actually some examples of this behind me. We've got a, a W. Hoffman on my left, uh, which would be a Czech-built piano by Bechstein. And on my right, we've got a Japanese-built piano uh, by Kawai. This is actually a hybrid piano, so we'll be talking about that uh, in just a minute. So with European pianos, you're generally getting a higher grade of material. And that material includes uh, a, a normally a more expensive or higher grade of felt on the hammer. Uh, often the shaping on the hammer has been done a little more accurately. Uh, you are also getting a higher grade of uh, spruce on the soundboard. Now this is something that's a little bit difficult to see from the front, uh, but certainly you can see it very, very clearly from the back and we'll get some footage for that for you as well. Uh, and the level of action regulation that occurs at the factory in most European builders is extremely high. Other refinements that European pianos uh, typically have, uh, at least in, in some, are going to be things like the A-graph, and you can see that that is this brass component right here that very accurately terminates the vibration on the string. It also makes alignment of the string a little bit easier, and it increases the longevity of the tuning. And so generally with a European piano, you are going to get a more precise tone. You are going to get a tone which behaves more consistently, whether you're in playing in the mid range of the instrument, the top of the instrument or the bottom of the instrument, you're going to have a piano that is going to usually have a higher degree of control uh, and a piano with where the construction is just going to last a lot longer. These are where you start to get into your 75-year pianos, your 100-year uh, pianos. Uh, really well built, well put together and designed for a multi-generational ownership experience. So we've covered some of the basics. Now, how do you go about choosing one of these pianos for yourself and for your home? What are the questions you should be asking? What are the differences that all of these things we've just discussed actually uh, result in in terms of your playing experience? First thing you're gonna have to decide in 2020 year, are you going to go with a traditional acoustic upright or is it worth taking a look at a hybrid? Now a hybrid, uh, in this context, I'm talking about something that combines both digital components as well as acoustic components. Uh, and companies uh, have gone at it both ways. In the case of Kawai, uh, they have built uh, digital pianos that have assumed acoustic uh, parts, such as the Nova series. But they've also taken acoustic pianos, such as the K300, which is a 48-inch Japanese instrument, and they have included digital components from their CA series uh, and come up with a really exciting product. So this represents a fairly new type of category where instead of just going with a traditional acoustic, which has absolutely no electronic componentry whatsoever, you have the option of going with an acoustic that can be muted and can be played in a completely silent mode. In this particular case, you have an instrument that has a control panel built right into the side the instrument can be entirely muted so that could be played on headphones or you can have it coming out of the electronic speakers as well. So it gives complete flexibility to be able to use that um, at night uh, as a digital piano but it comes with an additional cost because I'm sure people are out there like, well, that seems just more convenient. Why would everybody not do that? Well, that stuff doesn't come cheap. And in the case of the K300, it adds probably about $5,000 onto the cost of the instrument. Once you've decided whether you're going acoustic or some type of an acoustic digital hybrid, the next questions are really uh, comes down to playing style, uh, tonal style, and you know you spending some time in front of these perspective instruments. 
Upright pianos have very distinctive touches compared to grands, uh, and there are areas on upright pianos that tend to be weak spots where a really great design immediately solves a lot of these issues and you can tell right away. One of the things uh, that people uh, focus on with upright pianos is bass clarity. And this is very difficult to achieve in a shorter instrument uh, because when we're talking about a shorter piano, we're talking about these strings right here becoming even shorter uh, than they already are which means that you have to wrap those with even more copper so that you're getting the same amount of mass. And the more copper you wrap around a string, the less accurate that tone becomes. It starts throwing off all sorts of upper harmonics. So when you're first shopping for an upright piano, one of the things you're gonna to wanna to look for, if you play a lot of uh, repertoire pieces that use the lower third, is make sure you're getting something that's got a nice, clear bass tone doesn't mean that you have to get a 52 inch piano or even a 48 inch piano. I have played some 45 inch pianos uh, that have a scale design which result in a really nice clear tone. So uh, this is something to focus on but don't discount an instrument simply because it's shorter than a particular threshold. So that's the first tip that I would suggest. The second one and another uh, sort of a weak spot uh, that upright pianos uh, can be a little bit uh, touchy on is what I refer to as the break. It's the transitional uh, area of the piano where you go from steel strings and then you switch into these copper wound strings. And pianos that have dealt with this very, very well, um, you will certainly hear a transition of tone going from the uh, mid-range, the tenor, down into the bass section but you aren't going to hear a lot of super metallic tones or notes that really stand out. Uh, and so it usually occurs, it's not the same on every piano, but it usually occurs somewhere uh, three or four notes below middle C, um, and then it stretches down about an octave below that. So the break on this instrument is going to occur really from about the E down to about the G. So this is really gonna be the break on this particular instrument. And as you can hear, there's really no single note in there uh, where you're hearing a lot of uncontrolled harmonics or something feels a little too thuddy or too trebly, they've done a great job of transitioning from the top to the bottom. Um, pianos uh, that are usually a more basic design or haven't had the time or haven't had the, uh, the selection process done on the strings and the hammers will have a very uncontrolled transition uh, zone in there. As I said, I refer to that as the break. So that's the second thing that you're gonna wanna check out. Third one is gonna be action. Uh, there are actions out there made entirely of wood. There are actions out there that are made using a combination of both synthetic materials and wood. This was a subject of much debate 20 years ago. You still heard a little bit of it going on even 10 years ago. At this point in 2020, the vast majority of the professional community, both on the technical side and musical side, uh, have both accepted and recognized that a really great um, synthetic action uh, can be just as musical and in some cases have significant uh, maintenance benefits than using an inexpensive wood action. A lot of people then ask the question, well, if there's nothing wrong with synthetic actions, why do all the really top European companies still use wood actions? And there are two answers to that very excellent question. The first one simply is scale. You need to be a fairly large company in order to invest in the design, the equipment, and the manufacture of enough synthetic components that it would be worth your time to completely redesign your entire action. Kawhi did this, but Kawhi, of course, is one of the largest musical instrument companies on the planet. It is a billion dollar company, and it was worth the time for them to invest in the Millennium 3 action. Most European manufacturers, even though they are highly regarded, are quite small by comparison and an investment into that type of machinery, into that type of R&D, would make absolutely no sense. You'd bankrupt the company just experimenting with switching over to a completely new action. So part of it is just the scale of the company. The other part of it is that when you have stockpiles of wood and high quality wood, which has been aged properly, uh, there is a very, very low moisture content, 
uh, and you have manufactured this, uh, taking your time and really regulating it properly, great wood actions uh, can still be quite stable even in uh, humid climates or dry climates. They're still going to present some issues, but it's not that bad. So in other words, all wood actions are not created equal. When you take a wood action which has been manufactured with wood which hasn't been uh, you know, dried over a long period of time, uh, either with a great kiln process or an open air drying, that wood is gonna be a lot more reactive uh, to temperature and humidity than one which has been dried for say four or five years. Uh, so that is really kind of the, the difference or, or uh, some considerations uh, when you're thinking about a wood action versus uh, a synthetic action. But in terms of the playing experience, this really is how you need to test an upright action. You need to sit down and you need to play that action at a very soft dynamic range and then you need to do exactly the same thing at a fairly loud dynamic range. Upright actions are all generally going to feel pretty decent when you're playing at a mezzo forte without uh, you know, pushing its repetition speed and without really challenging uh, the trickier parts of its control range. Uh, the hardest thing for an upright piano to do is to deliver accuracy when you're playing down in the pianissimo range and particularly when you're playing fast and soft. So you're gonna wanna do this to make sure that the action on the instrument you're considering can deliver what you need. Otherwise, this may limit the amount of uh, dynamic range you're actually able to learn to control in front of that instrument. And that's one of the biggest complaints that teachers often had when they had students going back and forth between uprights and grands, was there just was no uh, uh, opportunity for those students to really hone those dynamic skills on the upright. And when they got on a grand, it's like they were uh, a complete fish out of water. So you're going to want to test that action. And then my last suggestion for uh, where to really judge an upright piano is going to be in the clarity of the tone, particularly in the top end range of the instrument. Because upright treble strings are so short, uh, proportionally speaking, you need even more refinement at, a, at smaller tolerances in order to, to achieve really great clarity in the top of an upright piano. And so when we're talking about clarity, we're talking about, yes, obviously the basics of making sure that the, your unison is, is, is in tune, but when you hit that string, are you hearing uh, any sort of other fluttering or, or very mild buzzing that's occurring? or uncontrolled harmonics or uneven harmonics. You know, one note that may have a very different character to another note. Uh, once you get into taller, very high-end uprights, you'll notice that that becomes as smooth as glass and every one of those notes behaves and sounds exactly the same. And as you get further down, both in size and in price and quality range, you're gonna start to hear a lot more variance and a lot more uh, unclean upper harmonics, particularly in the treble. So there are some suggestions on how to evaluate instruments as you are approaching this. Now we're gonna move on. So the last section that I'm gonna cover is a discussion on how one upright piano may differ from another upright piano. Because I know there's a lot of people who have a great deal of interest in understanding why one 48 inch piano might cost $8,000 and another 48 inch piano might cost 30. What causes that price gap to be so significant? Well, there's eight or nine components in an upright piano that's gonna directly contribute to both the cost and, uh, you know, conversely, uh, the uh, quality of the musical experience. So the first one I wanna talk about is back post and overall cabinet construction. When we're talking about cabinet, in this case, I'm not referring to the outer decorative panels, which in a lot of cases is just plywood or MDF that's been sprayed with polyester they don't really serve much of a structural purpose, they don't really serve much of a tonal purpose, they're really there to just uh, uh, sort of decoratively close in uh, the inner workings of the piano. The stuff that really matters is actually on the back. So let's come around here and see exactly what we mean when we're talking about cabinet design and construction. On this instrument, we have five back posts and that refers to these five pieces right there. There is a variety of approaches that manufacturers take with those back posts. You're gonna see instruments that have absolutely no back post at all, but a full perimeter steel plate. 
you will find instruments that have three, four, five, and in some cases, six back posts. And the function of those back posts, as well as the overall uh, construction and design uh, of that cabinet, uh, is both one of strength and rigidity, and when you get into a higher level instrument, it actually also takes on a tonal importance. Uh, when we're talking about instruments, very, very high-end upright pianos, such as the Beckstein, uh, Busendorfer, Steingreber, these are all very highly regarded uprights. Uh, the cabinetry on the back is so precise and designed in a way that not only is it giving the instrument strength, but it's actually contributing to the transmission of energy and tone throughout both the soundboard as well as the cabinet. On lower grade instruments, those are serving almost strictly a structural purpose and they're not really contributing a lot to the resonance of the instrument. So that's one difference where instruments can have a vastly different design is those back posts and the cabinet. We'll come around the front and look at a second area. Number two is how the strings are strung. Uh, we've already mentioned that agraphs are something that some manufacturers use on an upright piano and that's where those strings are terminated and pulled across sort of a tension bar. If they're using an agraph then it's just pulled through the agraph. And like we said, that contributes to uh, the alignment of the string and a really precise termination of the string. So that can help eliminate things like uh, false beats uh, or uh, you know, uncontrolled harmonics off a string. Another approach is what's called a pressure bar like this on the Kawai, where rather than individually having the uh, strings uh, strung through a graph, it's actually pulled down by a tension bar over uh, a capo, and that's what creates the terminating point. So this is another uh, significant difference in design. This is a very common approach for factory built pianos. Once you get into higher level pianos, the A graphs become a little more common, although it's still pretty hit and miss between which instruments are gonna have them and which ones are not. A third difference is how they handle the bridging or the bridges on the upright piano. Uh, just like a grand piano, there is quite a variety of uh, bridge designs uh, which bring along with it quite a variety of costs of designs. You've got everything from a solid bridge, which is a single piece of wood uh, with no cap to it, um, to you know, a, a hardwood bridge with a cap, all the way to a vertically laminated bridge, which is the most expensive type of bridge. Uh, so the better the bridge, to boil this down, uh, the better that it uh, carries the tonal energy that's in the string and uh, transmits that to the soundboard. And so you want something that is going to have that right balance of, of stiffness so that it doesn't absorb the energy, uh, but it can't be too stiff so that it doesn't actually vi you know, transmit the vibrational energy from the string. You also uh, want to avoid having that bridge uh, color uh, or bias the tone too much. And when you use a single piece of wood, you actually wind up sort of putting the tone through a filter in a way. And so those vertically laminated bridges on some of the higher level uprights uh, get around this by having different types of wood um, aligned differently so that you're, uh, you're giving uh, the tone every chance uh, and every frequency uh, equal opportunity to get to the soundboard uh, and resonate and then be amplified uh, from there. Fourth difference is the soundboard, and this one is a biggie. Soundboards come in both different sizes as well as different types of wood. Uh, virtually all of them have some type of spruce, but you're going to have solid spruce soundboards and then you're going to have laminated spruce soundboards, which sometimes are referred to as surface tension soundboards. Essentially, there's a trade-off of tonal quality for durability. Surface tension soundboards or plywood soundboards, as sometimes they're referred to in a bit of a pejorative sense, um, are actually significantly stronger and more stable. The biggest knock against them is that when you create all those different layers of wood and glue, you are substantially reducing its ability to resonate uh, and sustain that vibration. You've got all sorts of factors that are actually going to suck up more energy 
Uh, and so those instruments generally are going to uh, not be as loud, they are not going to sustain as well, and you're not going to get the same variety of harmonics out of those instruments. But on the flip side, you're never going to wind up with a cracked soundboard, and in a lot of cases, your tuning stability is a little bit better because those soundboards are less reactive to changes in temperature and humidity. So there is a choice between both a solid spruce soundboard as well as a laminated soundboard. If you have the ability to keep your instrument fairly uh, you know, regulated in terms of its temperature and humidity, there are many benefits to going with a solid spruce soundboard. And once we're in that camp, there's further differentiation from one piano to another. The next business factor is probably whether it is a tapered soundboard versus a traditional flat soundboard. Now, all soundboards have a curve to them. That's what gives it both uh, its energy as well as its ability to resist the pressure from the strings. But a tapered soundboard not only has a crown to it, a bend, but as you get closer to the edges, it actually starts to thin out. So as that soundboard gets closer to the edge where it's kind of clamped down and less likely to resonate, as it thins out, it, it increases the area that's able to actually vibrate. And so a tapered soundboard is going to be able to resonate over a larger area than an equal sized soundboard that would be uh, just flat, meaning uh, that it's the same thickness uh, in the middle of the soundboard as on the edges. And then finally, there is the difference of the wood. And this is uh, uh, probably a little bit more mythical uh, than anything, but there are real differences in how one type of spruce uh, sounds and reacts versus another type of spruce. The two main types are like a, uh, a white spruce, which is either like an, uh, an Alaskan white spruce or an Austrian white spruce, versus Sitka. And so Sitka is a very common, uh, less expensive spruce. It tends to have a warmer tone, but not quite as clear without quite the same level of sustain traditionally. Whereas white spruces uh, do tend to be a little clearer. They're a little more expensive, uh, but the grain tends to be uh, tighter uh, because they're grown at higher altitudes. So there are some considerations on the soundboard front. Of course, last but not least is the action. We've already talked about that in the video previously, discussing that difference between, say, a wood action versus a synthetic action, uh, but really uh, focusing in on how it's reacting to you and whether it's giving you the repetition speed you want and whether it's giving you that control in a lower range or the upper range. Every single upright piano brand is going to have a slightly different feel and a slightly different playing dynamic. So it's really important that you get in front of those so you find an action that you feel is just super connective and you love spending time playing it. So thank you very much for watching the video. I really hope that if you are in the market for an upright piano that this information has been helpful, helps to synthesize some of those questions that you need to be asking uh, and ultimately leads you to find an instrument you absolutely love and are going to have in your home for many, many years. We really appreciate you stopping by the Miriam Piano's YouTube channel. My name is Stu Harrison, and if you haven't had a chance to subscribe, we'd really appreciate if you did so. Keeps you up to date every time we come out with a new video, and we have a ton of fun doing this, so please leave us a comment as well. Have yourself a great day. We'll see you back soon.